The following podcast contains language and content which some listeners may find offensive. Discretion is advised. You are now locked in to Daddyless Daughters, the podcast. My name is Karina Mills. And my name is Alia Ali. And together we will be uncovering the layers of childhood trauma, relationships, sex, and men. Hi guys, welcome back to Dadless Daughters, the podcast. I go by the name of Alia Ali. And I go by Karina Mills. And today we have a very, 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 very special guest on. I'm very excited to have her on board. Um, She goes by the name of Nelly. And to start off with, she is going to do one of her phenomenal pieces of spoken word. You have to lose who you were to find out who you are, they said. I still don't know who I am. I came across people who constantly labelled me, judged me and did everything they could to change how others would view me. Little did they know I was just trying to be the love I never received. So because of those people, I never got the chance to live through my own identity. So again, how do you lose someone you were never able or even portrayed to be? I'll never understand why they were allowed to publicize the altered version when the only role they ever played were replaced characters in my book. Understand the true meaning of love, they said. I'll never be able to explain verbally. I'll only ever have the dictionary's definition it didn't grow within me. It's the only thing I never got to experience physically. Life stayed placing and then replacing the ones I've needed the most. Then left me to figure it out all alone. Alone. Trust me, there's not a thing you could tell me. I know too well what it feels like to be alone. To be in a room, let alone a world full of people and still feel alone. I started to hate the thought of life. I never got to enjoy it. Don't be a victim to this system and don't be a statistic to our society, they said. I wish I had parents. As a child who grew up in foster care, I must say life was so unpredictable. I never knew what was around that corner or what to expect. And everything was done in order to cover their back. My life became their secret. But being so young and naive, I always imagined the grass to be green on the other side. Now don't ask me what I'm referring to when I say the other side, because I don't know. I just wanted to escape everything I was going through at that time. I've been running and I'm still running. I grew up in a system that never listened and I was so scared to face society because I knew at some point I wouldn't be classed as their priority. And this pandemic has proven that to be true. Foster care for me felt like a punishment, something that was meant to last only 10 minutes on the naughty step but in actual fact became a wound that's never healed. And being a care leaver feels like I'm doing a life sentence for a crime I didn't commit. Feels like I was thrown into the deep end of life with no swimming lessons, no life vests. And I just want to get out of that pool now. I hope this pain doesn't last long. I've always had this feeling that I won't last long. But at some point, I feel like I deserve kids so I can pass on. The pain of my past numbed me so I don't cry no more. The care system killed me mentally so I can't die no more. Life broke my wings so I can't fly no more. Deep down, I was made to feel as though I was never enough for myself. My actions said educate me, love on me, be there for me and never leave me. But their words belittled me, manipulated me and misled me. Still till this day, I'm paying for it. From one door to another is how I've spent the last 16 plus years of my life. So I don't know a thing about stability. I went from foster family to foster family residential and back again with so many questions as to why this was all happening to me. It felt as if God handpicked me. So I'm not too good with people. You see, I can let you go in a heartbeat because I was let go in a heartbeat by the same woman who let my heart beat. Don't let your depression define you, they said. How? And that shit grows from inside you. You see, life taught me the biggest battle you'll ever have to fight is the one against yourself. I've been fighting and I'm still fighting. Be patient, they said. When time is something I have no control over and when the only promise life has ever made me is death. Should now do what God called you to do before it's too late, they said. I've been waiting on that call. I've got a feeling it's too late. So someone please tell God I'm trying to find purpose in my pain. You can't pray for someone who doesn't pray for themselves, they said. I've prayed and thanked the Most High all my life. 
At times it felt like it, I was speaking to myself. Remove anything in life that you ever have to question, they said. So at one point, I'm not going to lie, I removed God because there were too many unanswered questions. It just felt like a one-sided connection. They said, you can't live life trying to explain the pain of your past. Going through it first-handedly will be the only way they'll ever understand you. I think I get it now. I've been left with memories and I can't put a face to them anymore. There's a certain scent that will take me way back to 2004. There's a certain time of the year I'll sit behind a closed door, drop a few tears, ask God what I'm doing this for. I've been trying to forgive them, but I can't forgive myself. I didn't want to lose them, so instead I lost myself. Wow. Yeah. Girl, you've definitely found purpose in that pain. Hmm. And I can feel it. And, oh my God, it's too much. It's too much. I feel very blessed to have met you. And thank you for sharing that with us. Wow, How thank you for having me. How you feel? Um, I feel like a weight's been lifted off my shoulder. Like, honestly, I feel, I don't know, I do feel like I'm on a journey to finding purpose in my pain. Mm. So, yeah. So tell us a bit more about where that pain comes from. Obviously, you've painted a, a very vivid picture for us. Um, but now when you come on the show, it's like your voice is so soft. But then when you step into that beast, into that expression, it's like two different people it's crazy but um so I was taken into care well I, I say taken I was left by my mother um at the age of two I was left in a derelict building me and my brother um I remember the day like it was yesterday um we was playing hide not hide and seek it was peekaboo and I remember one time I covered my eyes and I, I said boo and I never saw that lady again I could never play that game it still haunts me to this day so yeah, I came into the care at the age of two. I was I had a brother two years older than me. Our first foster family was our longest. It lasted like seven years, and then we moved on to another foster family due to um, the allegations that they made against my brother. Um, a lot of things happened in that first foster family that I did I wasn't aware of at the time. I was like a sponge. Like babies are like sponges, and life is like bleach. Mm. And when you put that sponge in bleach and you rinse it out. No matter how many times you wash it, it's stained. Yeah. So I was stained from a lot of things that took place in that placement. I was of a later age, I realised that things went down the way it did. So um, eventually me and my brother went our separate ways. I think that, that broke me because it's like you go into this world and you just know one person and there's a million and one people in this world and that one person's just ripped away from you. So I just, I hated everyone in my life at that point. Mm. and then I hated the system because it's like you guys were the ones who took him away they never explained it was all done in secret to be honest I was in primary school and I used to go on these trips these outings with um you know like okay so I would have a social worker and my carers would have a social worker yeah. and the there was a company that my carer's social worker worked for and someone would come and take us on respite trips just to give the carers a break mm -hmm. so I remember one day after school I, I was taken to McDonald's it was on Penge High Street mm -hmm. and I was sat in McDonald's I watched the sun go down so I knew I was so calculated when I was younger I knew something was wrong mm -hmm. it doesn't take how many hours to eat a happy meal so I went back home and I ran to my brother's room. Um, that placement, it was kind of weird because me and my brother, we weren't allowed to communicate. We weren't allowed in the same part of the house. So what we would do is when we would get home, um, we, is, there's another part of the story as well, but yeah, when we would get home, we would run to each other's rooms. And that day I ran to my brother's room and it was empty. Wow. So me, I'm, I'm checking under the bed to see where my brother is because the wardrobe, there's no clothes in there. And then I was, I just started crying and, and they left me to cry. No one came to check on me that night. They came and explained that my brother had left due to his behavior and things like that. And I said, I understand. Mm -hmm. But um, I just want to go into that placement because that placement, um, it messed with me mentally. Mm -hmm. So I was around the age of 10 when I went to that placement. As I said, me and my brother was never allowed in the same part of the house. 
Um, we was never allowed to leave the house to go to school together at the same time. We weren't allowed to communicate with each other. I couldn't view him as my brother. It was very um, damaging. I used to go to a school in Bromley. And as you can imagine, the, the lunch and stuff was expensive. I used to get £2 a day. That literally got me nothing but a hot sausage roll for lunch. Didn't ever get me a meal. So what we would do is me and my brother, we would buy the 50p nice biscuits with the covered in sugar. We used to get searched at the door. So we would put the biscuits at the front of, I used to put it at the front of my belly in between my skirt and my tight. And I'd run to his room. Um, sometimes our room would get searched. So we'd find hiding places. And then we'd wait until night time. And we had this, um, this temporary wall that was up. So we'd speak through the wall. That really damaged me mentally. That's like prison. That's what I used to do in jail, like to communicate with girls that were under my cell or to do, we would talk through the ventilation. And like you're saying, it's a mind game that they start playing with us from a young age. They put us in a mental prison, but carry on. So yeah, I was like, I was 10 when that happened. So um, I want to speak more about my first foster placement. Yeah. I ended up going back there. I didn't go back there because I missed it. I went back there to relive it a lot in my life. And people find it strange that I remember so much at a younger age, but I would probably not remember as much now. Mm. Um, so basically what had happened is things had, went, so things had happened with my foster family, um, their son. A lot of things happened. Um, I didn't realise at the time until I moved on and I was replaced in Brixton. Let's just cut a long story short. One day I was play fighting with my carer's grandson. And as we were play fighting, I gave him a love bite. And then when the family came, um, when my carer came, she was like, what's that on my grandson's um, face? And I, I was like, a love bite. And this is the time I was like 12, 13. Mm. And I was like, yeah, it's just a love bite. And for me, I didn't know, I didn't know anything else. I, that's what I knew it was called. And that's, that's what was done to me. So I just did what was done to me. Mm. So no one explained the, um, the wrongs of my actions. I just remember them calling me nasty. I wasn't allowed around anyone. They separated me. I remember I had to go to my room. I stayed in my room for days. And then it wasn't until that took place where I realized that some of my behaviors weren't normal. So like I said, I didn't go back to my first foster family because I missed it. I went back to relive it, to try and make sense of what was really happening to me. So I think it was just before um, I turned 18, when I was 17, I went back there. And I stayed in that room and memories just came back to me of the things that was happening to me and it's just like I couldn't believe it but I didn't want to believe it because I viewed those people as like my family like I didn't know I went into I didn't know I was a foster child until let's say I was like seven or eight I remember going into primary school and I just walking through the playground with my brother and everyone's looking at you and I'm like, why are they looking at me so strange? And then everyone's got this newspaper in front of them. And I was on the front cover of the new shopper because they were giving me up for adoption. And that's the day I found out I was in care. So before that, I, I viewed these people as my family. Like I didn't know I was a foster child. Yes, so a lot of my life was confusing. Um, a lot of things were confusing. So like I said, I went back and I stayed in that room and, and I wouldn't sleep for days. I wouldn't bath for days. I wouldn't, I wouldn't eat for days just because the memories were coming back. And it's just like, how, how did this guy, how did he get away with doing that to me? Yeah, so what were the memories? Can you speak us through them? Um, so I don't, I don't like um, really addressing it too much, but I just remember being on my back and just the kind of, um, the kind of actions that I know is not appropriate for a child mm. at the age of three. Mm. Two grown men. Um, I, I, I said they're foster son, but they also had, um, you know, the black culture when you have like that auntie that isn't really related, but she's family. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, she had a son that was living there at the time as well, and I, I will always remember him. So yeah, I asked. Um, I was I was told a lot in my life that um, the things that I remember didn't transpire and didn't take place so that's one of the main reasons why I went back there because I didn't ever want to accuse someone of doing something like that and it to not be true mm -hmm. so um with that being said my brother is one of the people who I don't know if he believes that that's happened or whatnot but yeah so let's fast forward a bit so I end up moving on from that placement 
it just broke down. I couldn't look them in the face anymore. Like it just, it was not good for my mental. So I ended up moving and living by myself after a while. I think I turned, I think it was just before my 19th birthday, I moved in by myself. And when I say I was fighting demons, like I was fighting demons. So did you disclose to anybody about the flashbacks that you were having? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was, so when I moved in by myself, I, a day came and I, I just couldn't, I couldn't deal with the demons. So I, I found myself like hanging over my balcony. Um, my neighbours came and the police were there and I was just like, after everything um, settled down the next, the next week, I think the following week, I said, I can't, I can't do this. So there was someone in Lambeth, I'm not going to disclose her name. She was my IRO when I first moved. When I first came into care, she was my IRO and then she worked her way up to being the head of Lambeth Social Services. Sorry, I just want to explain to the audience what an IRO is, an independent review officer. Um, they're basically higher ranked social workers and they're supposed to make sure that social workers are doing the job that they get paid to do, basically, and they're offering the support that the young people need um, during their time. So carry on, sorry. Oh yeah, so um, she explained that it was her last day and that's the one lady who I can say that had my back. Like anytime I speak on my time in care, I speak on her because it was, it was never about the money. It was never, she went beyond, like above and beyond for me. Um, I found out it was her last week. She offered to come and see me. And then when I saw her, I just, I said to her, I said, I'm, I'm really fighting demons, demons I didn't think social services would believe. So I told her what had happened and I told her who it was and we cried together and she said, I'm so sorry. And she said, I knew there was something about your behavior. It just, it didn't make sense to me. And she said that we investigated it and she apologized mm. because she wasn't able to stop it sooner. And I said, it's not your fault. Um, but to cut a long story short, that man is actually under investigation um, 10 years on for something he's done more recently. So that was the, all the confirmation I need that really transpired. Mm. And I wasn't just, I, it's just because when you've been told for so long, yeah. like for instance, me and my brother's relationship broke down. Like I don't speak to him till this day because after I've told him that this has happened and Lambeth have notified him of this is what's happened he still had the cheek to go and be around these people. And it's just like, for me, it's like, if, if my sibling told me that this is what happened to me, it's like, I could never see myself. I don't know if that's weird, but I could never see myself being involved in people who could cause that, that pain. I don't, I don't get it. And we talk about this, like as Dalila's daughters, the layers of loss and like grieving people that are still alive and levels of betrayal that we feel um that that's just traumatic within itself so to, to manage that trauma as well as sexual abuse as well as trying to even piece the pieces of your life together mm -hmm. this is this is too much weight for any adolescent to have to ha handle that by themselves and i'm so grateful to know that at least there was that one iro that mm -hmm. that one professional who, who showed you what empathy looks like yeah i'm forever grateful for her honestly but yeah my time in care it was just I don't know it, it scarred me because there's so much that I could get into but it's just like it's too much it's too much it's, and it was like it was a never-ending spiral that was really getting out of control and it's just like who's gonna who's gonna control this situation mm -hmm. I don't know man but I didn't get where I felt it was it was personal and I didn't know what I did to them for it to be personal mm -hmm. I want to touch on um, your school and your education um, and, and how did you interrupt that development for you? Because to be able to write the way that you write, like, I want to know how, how was that journey for you? Um, did you get to finish school? Um, so my schooling journey, um, that's, that's what emotional one. So I went to a school in Grove Park and I'll always treasure that school. I still go back there till this day. Um, and then I ended up moving. But when I, was go when I was picking my choices for my secondary school, I always had it in my mind that I didn't ever want to lose those friends. Like they, those were the longest people I knew. So it's like, I always asked my social worker, please, 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 can I go to the same school as everyone else? They didn't even put it on my choices. So I ended up going to an all girls school. Um, it was in Bromley. And I'm not gonna, it, I was like the class clown. I was like, I was seeking the intention in school that I didn't receive at home. Mm. And got in a lot of trouble for that. So my last day there, I got excluded a numerous of time 
Um, but my last day there, I was arrested off premises. Um, I don't think it was deemed as something that was necessary, but I just feel like it happened and I had to move on from it. So anyway, I ended up going to a people referral unit um, that was in West Norwood. From there, because I didn't belong there, like I was never a naughty child, it was quite easy to reintegrate into a new school. So I went to a school in Tulse Hill. Um, and that's that's another thing that really that really haunts me because it's like with school, school was like my safe place. Mm-hmm. School was where I escaped everything. I didn't have to see these monsters. I was just around normal people. Um, and it's just like, so when I went to that school, that was around one, it was around my last years. So it was from year 10. And then I was supposed to do year 11 there. But what had happened is my placement in Brixton broke down. Mm-hmm. so that was a setup and it was a kind of a betrayal because it was like it was happening from people as I said they were my I found out they were my biological family so let's cut a long story short basically I had a problem with the fact that I was always treated as a foster child I was never nothing about anything I was going through was normalized I wasn't allowed to hang out with friends I wasn't allowed to go to friends house I had to go to school come straight home and have no outside life I didn't have a phone I didn't have nothing um, what I used to do is I used to leave school and I used to go to my friend's house that lived in Brixton. So she lived near McDonald's and I lived on the other side of KFC. If you know Brixton, you know that's not even a two minute walk. Um, I knew the protocol. So what would happen is I'll go there and I'll get my friend's stepmom to call my carer so they know where I am and they know the address and everything. But what my carer would do is she would call the police and report me as missing. So that was more of a spiteful thing. So I understood that. Cut a long story short, I remember it was like a Wednesday and my carer was like, yeah, this placement's broke down now. Um, They're going to come and get you and they're going to take you to a care home. So I just didn't understand uh, me from me going to foster families to foster families to then going to a care home. So I said, okay, so I started packing my things and I had already arranged for me to go and stay with that friend um, because there was no way I was going to a care home. So when my carer seen that I've packed my stuff, she said, where are you going? Like, you're not leaving sort of thing. So she kind of persuaded me to stay. I won't let them take you. Me not realising in my head that it was her who told them to come and take me in the first place. I was a bit dumb for that. So me, like an idiot, I stayed there. And I remember it was a Saturday. I remember like five o'clock in the morning, 4.30, five o'clock in the morning. I just hear a bang at my door. And I'm just like, what's happening? So um, the carers come in and she said, yeah, they're here to come and take you. So I'm like, first of all, Saturday, who works on a Saturday in the, in the thingy? And then I was like, second of all, why? I thought you was not going to let them come and take me. So I was just like, I get your plan. So if you know the houses in Brixton, like, like they, most of them have extensions. So from my window, I could jump out my window and jump onto the, um, the thingy from the kitchen. So I said, okay, that's my plan. So when she closed the door, I think I'm in there a bit too quiet and she's realised thingy. So she's opened the door. My body is halfway through the window. I haven't made it fully yet. She's kind of, she's given them permission. And it was like five big grown men. She's given them permission to come and restrain me. So basically they've restrained me. They've come, they've taken me. They've put me in the car, whatever. But I remember this scream, like this scream haunts me. She was so, what's the word? She was so heartless. It's like my neighbours came out and comforted me. And it's like she had no feeling in her body. She didn't care. She was, she was trying to um, hush away the other kids to not make them see what was going on. And it's just like, you're so heartless. So anyway, I was told I was going to Brighton and da 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 And I was just like, okay. So I'm in the car. And I was sleeping for some time. And I was just like, I know Brighton. And I know Brighton is not this far away. Like I was in the car for a good three plus hours. So I'm looking at the um, signs and then I'm asking the driver, where are we going? And they're like, you're going to um, Kings Bromley and Kings Bromley is not far from Birmingham. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, so what happened to Brighton? So they all laughed and they were like, no, we're not going to Brighton. So I said, oh, so they lied to me. So anyway, cut a long story short. um, I've gone into this place and it's like, it's gated everything. Everything is electric gates. I've gone down this farm place to go into this building. and then I've met the staff and whatever, and they've told me that it's a secure unit. So I said, okay, um, the doors were locked. Um, the first thing that kind of confused me is the fact that I had like four staff members in one room. 
So I looked at a staff member and I said, you don't know, you don't need so many people. Like, I'm very small. And he was like, this is just a protocol. Like, and then they told me the ins and outs of what's going to happen and that they're going to search through my bags and stuff. I'm not allowed a phone. Um, my door will be kept open 24 hours. Someone's on the landing. The knives are locked away. The front door will never be unlocked. Mm -hmm. You have to use a staff to get out. And I was like, wow. And then they told me I was there for two weeks. And I said, okay. It took me a while to come around to the two weeks because it's like two weeks is a long time. And I was just like, if it's two weeks, then it's two weeks. I kind of tried to persuade myself that I deserved it in a sense. So the two weeks came and basically when you get there, you're not allowed to leave the premises, not even to go to the shop or anything. Everyone had to get my toiletries for me. So the two weeks have come and I have three people on my contact book. It's my social services um, my cousin Quincy who I adore and I love and it was a the friend that I was visiting at Brixton so I've called um, the first person I called was Quincy and I just let him know what was happening and I said Quincy I'm really in prison like obviously I'm just laughing it off because I said oh but my two weeks is done now so I'm coming home soon and then I was like free me and he's laughing laughing so the two weeks have come anyway and I've called my social worker and I said, oh, okay, so where am I going from here? So my social worker said, oh, yeah, you're just staying there until the summer holiday's done. So I was like, I was angry. I was like, how can it go from two weeks to until the holiday's done? To cut a long story short, obviously, my, the school for that building, yeah, is in a hut behind the house. Mm -hmm. I had a farm that was bigger than my school on that premises none of my school teachers were qualified for the subjects that they taught and they always used to laugh about it and it's just like I said okay I persuaded myself that I could do the summer holiday and like I won't be distracted I'll just I'll focus whatever and then the summer holidays came and obviously I'm bringing up my social worker because I need to get school stuff like my school uniform and da 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 my social worker said oh you're doing your last year here that's when I cried man cried cried for days I cried I remember I was in lockdown I got feet along the walls I was so mad at everything like how can I do my last year here I'm not even able to do GCSEs here like everything that I've just gone through in my school life has gone to waste because they don't provide the facilities and I was just so I was so mad so yeah school life for me it was it was terrible because even when I came back to London um, after and tried to go into a college, it's like a lot of colleges didn't even accept me because the qualifications I had weren't even equivalent to GCSEs. Mm. They basically just set you up to fail. That's exactly what they set you up for, all these failures. I know, it was the, it was the constant, oh, you're here for two weeks and then you're here for so and so and then and I was just like I, I remember being in that room and I used to beg and plead like please please don't let me stay here I knew this the social worker didn't like me her, she she hated me like you could see it every visit it was huffs and puffs and she used to paint me out to be this monster and I used to tell her I'm not this person you want me to be you know I'll never be that person never hmm. um there's a few questions I want to ask you like I asked you this question before, but um, growing up in foster care, what was your perception on the way white children were treated compared to the black kids that were in care? Did you see any indifference? Um, not in terms of the children, really, but in terms of the carers, 101%. Um, in terms of like, so I went to this um, Caucasian family and it's like, I wish I could have stayed there. Like, I know my life wouldn't have ended up the way it did. Yeah. I wish I could have stayed there. All the, every black carer I had, is, uh, it's like, I was reminded constantly that you are here to pay my mortgage. You are here as part of my partner and you are just a payment at the end of the month. Like, I was reminded. It's not words or it's not a feeling. It was told to me that this is why you're in my house. Like, that, to know that you're here because you, you pay the bills is crazy. Wow, mm, that's, it's essentially like, it's just inhumane. How can someone say that? Like, you've just been tricked and tricked and traded your whole entire life. And your child. I'm gobsmacked, I can't lie. I've, I know I've been sat here quite quiet. It's just because I'm speechless to hear that. Like, don't get me wrong, I know um, from knowing, Aaliyah, that these things do happen in care homes and things like that, but to sit and hear it from someone else and other young girls that we've spoken to and young women 
it's a continuous thing and it's so real and it's happening to a lot of people. And it's still happening now. Do you know what I'm saying? So why is it not being stopped? That's what I'm saying. And the worst thing about um, the system, yeah, is that I've always wanted to stay in the field to just try and change the, um, the structure of how foster care and thing is. But it's like, there's so many factors and, mm. the, and it all comes down to that foster carer. Because that foster carer has a choice. That foster carer has a choice to either bring you in and try and accept you wholeheartedly. But that boils down to you as a human. And a lot of them aren't human. Mm. Like a lot of them are cold hearted, cold. And it's it it hurts so much that a lot of the, the black carers, like every black carer I had, it's like they were trying to punish me for I don't know what for. I don't know what for. Mm. I can't sit here and say to you that there was this carer and she was amazing, like she changed my life. How many foster placements that, did you put together? Um, I think I had like approximately ten. 10 foster placements and how many social workers? Um, I had my first social worker for let's say eight, seven, eight years and then after that it's like I changed social workers every other year so mm. I can't remember. There's a lot of them in it. There's a lot and it's the fact that you then become, if I stayed with my first social worker it's like that would have made more sense if she had good intentions but after you change that one social worker who's like really, has really like started off with you it's like the rest of them are just reading a case file. Right. They don't even get to know you. So in terms of after you disclosed like your um, abuse um, and the flashbacks that you was having and stuff, how did they support your mental health, how you was going to manage your, you know, your healing process really? Was any support offered to you? Um, no support has been offered. Like I've been asking for counselling in terms of like everything, in terms of my time and care, in terms of what's happened. I've been offered CAMS when I was younger. But I didn't know if that helped. I went there. Um, and the craziest thing about it is before I moved to where I'm living now, that person lived in the same building as me, which is why I was on the balconies, because I've seen him like in the flesh and I didn't realise he lived in the same building as me. So when I've gone to my social services and I've explained to them that like, I can't stay in this building and like try and move on with my life when I'm, I'm faced with this demon every single day. So I didn't go to work for a year. I didn't leave my house for a year. I did nothing with myself. I, I didn't feel safe to leave. And then when I really got out of my comfort zone and realized that this isn't really the life that I want, like I've never been someone who's waited on handout. Everything I've got, I've worked for so hard myself. Mm -hmm. So it's like the, the no working thing wasn't like working out for me. It wasn't good for me. It wasn't healthy. So even after that, I used to get cabs. Um, to the nearest bus stop just so I didn't bump into this person and whatever and then I said I can't really live like this and it took for so long for my social services to um like even for them to write a letter on my behalf to my housing was a struggle mm. so yeah so for I know the answer to this but for those who don't know how old are you now I'm 21 years old and what's life like life um is Life is okay. Um, I had to realise that life is really what you make it and it's either you're going to let the past make or break you or you're going to live in it mm. or you're going to step out of it and I'm just trying to step out of it. I'm trying to, as I said, find purpose in my pain. Like, even, There's been so many attempts of me giving up um, physically and it's just like every time I, I bring myself to it, it's like I went through too much. Mm. I went through too much to give up now and it's just like, I ain't never been a loser. I've never been someone to quit. It's never been in me. So life now is I work um, with the elderly. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, I just got my start date for a civil service job that I'll be doing in August. Um, I just sorry. Well, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I just and I've finally moved out of that house and I've moved into a lovely place. So yeah. The worst thing about it, yeah, is that, you know, when the pandemic happened, I was so vexed. Like, I was like, how can you really put me in this situation? But it's like, if that pandemic never happened, I would have never wrote that piece. And this would have never really happened. So it's like, you just got to see the positive out of everything. Exactly. It's going to take time, you know, and like somebody who's a bit ahead of you in your journey um, and has a similar story is like, there is no end date. Do you get what I'm saying? The greatest power that we have is to be able to live in that state of pain, tap in and out of it and use it as a creative expression of ours and obviously help those that we know that we can help.
Um, and that's going to yeah. be power. Like, you know, those real life superheroes that we was waiting for to bust through the door, but it weren't them. It was always the demons. Uh, Honestly. Those superheroes. I can't, I can't wait to see what um, life has planned for me. I can't wait to see what has planned for you too. So if you could, if you had any advice for a daddyless daughter who's at a place where you was um, in, their, in their journey, what would be your advice? Um, my advice would be for what it's worth it's never too late you can change or you can stay the same there's no rules to this game you can make the best or the worst of it I just hope you make the best of it I hope you see things that startle you I hope you feel things you've never felt before I hope you meet people who have a different point of view I hope you're living a life that you're proud of Mm. and if not I hope you have the courage to start all over again I just want to remind you that you didn't come this far to only come this far. I pray you transform into the best version of yourself and understand the power of the tongue. I speak nothing but life over you. And that is a beautiful way to end up. Thank you so much for coming on and thank you so much for choosing Daniel's Daughters to help you to just tell your story. And I hope you feel like some kind of, even if it's small, or some kind of small weight has been lifted through telling your story. And I know that there's going to be loads of young girls and women out there that's going to hear it mm. and they're going to relate and they're going to be thankful that you've told it. And they will understand like, wow, there's women out there like me. Yeah. Um, and I hope they come forward as well because yeah. this is about like we, we want to really build this community and harness in on it so like I really thank you for um uh, sort of our journey as well and mm-hmm. coming along this with us and we're still quite early in it so hopefully you know you can watch the magic unfold unfold I will thank you so much for having me and listening to my story um I was a bit nervous but you guys made me feel comfortable so I just appreciate that we so, got yeah. Don't worry about it. Thank you for listening to Daddyless Daughters, the podcast. Don't forget to follow us on Insta at daddyless underscore daughters. And for more information on how you can get involved, then please visit the website at www.daddylessdaughters.co.uk. If you've been affected by any of the topics raised in today's podcast, then please call one of the following helplines. For Samaritans, call double one six one two three for bernardo's call 0800 double one double one or alternatively call mind on 0800 123 3393 thank you